is recording. So, all right, guys. Today we're gonna do something a little bit different. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the uh, uh, the inception or who created the Georgia Guidestones. Uh, there's a big mystery out there about them. So, you know, as we're approaching this, what they call the New World Order per se, we want to dig in a little bit deeper. Today I got my guest here, Ron Barry. Uh, we thank you for joining us, and we're just going to listen in and see what he has to say about the Georgia Guidestones. Again, guys, thank you all for tuning in. If you like this stuff, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and help us out. Uh, the Georgia Guidestones are very much misunderstood. Uh, there's two groups. One group believed that the New World Order is behind it, it's some sort of evil cabal. And then there's another group that believe it's, it's satanically inspired and I, I'm here to say I'm 75 to 80 percent sure I know who commissioned them who RC Christian which was a pseudonym uh, I, I'm 75 to 80 percent sure I know who that is and uh, I will not tell you come right out and tell you the name of the man but I'll give you a couple of clues and if you're really interested in the subject uh, you should be able to figure it out from my two clues the first clue I'll give you is the word or name paradox. And the second clue is there's two people left alive who know the actual identity of R.C. Christian, but they won't speak. But the banker uh, made the statement and said that uh, nobody probably would recognize R.C. Christian's real name, but they might recognize his son's name, and almost everyone would recognize his son's work. Now those two clues, if you really study and, and, and uh, dig deep on it, I think by using those two clues, you can figure out who the real identity of R.C. Christian was. R.C. is dead now. He's been dead uh, for quite a few years. Um, the Georgia Guidestones themselves, uh, the message on them is, is, is really, uh, a lot of people get all upset when they hear the, uh, that uh, only 500 million people are to inhabit the earth. Well, that's not saying that all the people will be destroyed or anything like that. That's just saying that the earth operates best uh, when it's not so overpopulated. And that just makes sense because if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, you'll, you'll find out that the earth was not much more populated than that. And indigenous peoples have said for uh, years that we need to go back and follow nature more and more and and so i think that's really the mess the key message behind the georgia guidestones it's not about killing off large numbers of people it's not about uh, creating a new world order it's just about living in common sense with nature and uh, i think that's a chief message and i think when you do figure out the identity of the man uh, the real man behind R.C. Christian, you will understand that it, it's just, it was just a man that was interested in uh, putting out some truths and he had no evil agenda or any agenda of trying to obtain power or anything like that. So I think that so much of the, uh, especially what's on the internet concerning the Georgia Guidestones, I hate to say it, but it's just pure garbage. And uh, now, we're getting to another subject now. And I wanted you to do a little research on that. And in the process, you'll learn about what the message was behind the Georgia Guidestones. This book here, Revelations of the Metatron, in my estimation, and this will get me in a lot of trouble probably, I think this is the most important book that has ever been written or published on planet Earth today, even more so than the Holy Bible or any of the other religious texts. I think this book here goes back and explains a lot that is left out of the Bible. 
if you study any uh, Native American prophecy, especially the Hopi and some of the Aztec and Mayan prophecies, you're going to see that uh, much of what they had to say is revealed within this book. Uh, the Hopis speak about five world ages and that we're living in the fourth age and soon to pass into the fifth age. The Aztecs and Mayans said that there were six world ages and that we, we were living in the fifth and soon to go into the sixth. They're both correct. It, the, the problem was the Hopis started one age late. They started when human beings were created and the Aztecs and Mayans started in a previous world age and if you look at the bible and it's very accurate in this genesis is actually quite accurate uh you'll find out in the first couple verses something had happened to the earth uh it was just everything was pretty much destroyed and uh, that was actually the first world age and, and there was a great cataclysm that, that occurred and you're only going to learn about that from this book here uh, another book that I recommend that uh, goes with this book is a book entitled He Walked the Americas. It's written by uh, Lucille Taylor Hansen, and it deals with uh, myths and legends and prophecies of various uh, indigenous peoples, especially in South, Central, and North America. And uh, it's a very important book, and it really uh, kind of takes off where this book left off. Um, I just hope that if, if you want a copy of this book, there's only one way of, of getting it that I'm aware of, and you need to contact the uh, uh, publisher of uh, Fate Magazine, and I'm not endorsing Fate Magazine. I'm not even endorsing this book. As far I have no uh, economic uh, incentives at all. I just happen to really believe strongly in this book. But if you want a copy, contact the uh, publisher of Fate Magazine. I think her name is Phyllis Galdi. And uh, she can get you a copy of this book. There's only a few copies left. But uh, I would strongly suggest that uh, you take the time, put forth the effort, and, and read and study it. Don't read it as a novel, but possibly uh, read it like a chemistry textbook. And uh, it's not that complicated, but it needs to be really uh, looked at closely. Um, every time you reread it, you're going to learn more and more and more. And it speaks about the different world ages, how they began and how they ended. Uh, for instance, many people have heard of the Younger Dryas period, which occurred about 10,900 BC. Uh, that is the end of one age. Uh, a lot of people are not aware that uh, some recent scientific uh, discoveries using uh, ice cores from Greenland show that there was another cataclysm that occurred on Earth around 5,000 BC. And that would have been the, the end and the beginning of another world age. And there, before 10,900, I, I really can't tell you how far that world age went back. It could have gone back 15, 20, maybe even 100,000 years. It's hard to say. There's no, at this point, with what archaeologists and anthropologists have uncovered, we really can't tell exactly. Uh, how long that world age lasted and we can't really tell you how long the first world age lasted uh, before uh, there was a great cataclysm in the entire universe and uh, there's been a lot of uh, research recently uh, concerning the Den Denisovans and uh, these are very important people and when you study this book or look at it you're going to see a group of people called the Amen I personally, personally believe that the Amen, the, 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 the Denisovans, and the Watchers that are seen in the Bible, and, and by the way, the Watchers are only described twice in the Bible, two different verses. One is in Daniel chapter 4, 
And in neither case in the Bible are the watchers portrayed as a negative uh, entity. It's only in the book of Enoch that they are really admonished and, and shown as uh, very ne in a very negative sense. So I personally believe the watchers, the amen, and the Denisovans are all the same uh, beings. And you may not agree, and that's fine. Uh, but you should uh, become acquainted with the uh, in group of entities called the Amen. Uh, actually, the whomever was the uh, editor uh, of the King James Bible was very, uh, I'd say, a little bit tricky. He hid the Amen within within the verses of the Bible. And I think it's Genesis chapter six. It starts out, and if you look at it in the King James Version, you'll see the first word is Amen. And uh, it's also, if you go over into, uh, I think it's Revelations chapter 3, there's one of the verses, I think it's like 314 or somewhere, somewhere close to there. It again describes the Amen and describes exactly the same uh, situation as you'll find in this book. So uh, they've been known, but they've been hidden for, for millennia, their, their uh, true identity. So uh, if, you, if you begin to understand the Amen and uh, how they relate to human beings, uh, I think that's, at least that would be very, a very important thing to learn. Um, Another interesting thing, and Isaac Newton actually was on the right track. Isaac Newton, in his research, and a lot of people don't realize this, they think that Isaac Newton was just a scientist. He actually spent more time studying prophecy of the Bible than any other subject. He also was very interested in alchemy. But one of the things that he uh, found to be a truth was that the Trinity was not three in one, as everybody was teaching, but that the Trinity was actually three separate entities. And you'll find that to be described exactly that way in this book. It tells you exactly who the Trinity uh, is, and it, it, uh, it also will describe um, God in a little different way than what most people have been taught and it also will describe two separate Satans all Satan means is adversary uh, and in this case uh, the Satan was an adversary to God uh, many people when they think of Satan they think of a, a devil with a pitchfork and all this stuff and that's 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 so far away from the real truth uh, there have been two Satans there is a Satan that is at work today. He's actually known as the Prince of Darkness, and he all the dark arts and stu stuff that uh, all the dark stuff that goes on in the world today. He's behind that. The original Satan was not involved in the dark arts. His problem was greed and uh, pride and vanity and jealousy and disobedience. But he was never into the dark arts, and to th at this time. Uh, that first Satan is not active today, at least not in the form of an adversary. In, in, actually, he's an advocate of, uh, of God. If you really want to understand it, you need to understand the parable of the good son and the, and the uh, prodigal son. Most preachers will preach sermon after sermon after sermon of the good son and the prodigal son and they have no clue of what they're really talking about. It's like an onion. Most preachers <clears throat> preachers only teach about the outer layers uh, like of, uh, of the onion. They never get to the core of the onion. And when you get to the core and understand the true meaning of the parable of the good son and the prodigal son, then you'll have some real true understanding. And at this time, uh, the Hopi claim we're coming very close to what's known as the day of purification. Within this book, 
it's referred to as the renewal. I think they're one and the same. And I think the prodigal son, his identity will soon be revealed. Uh, the prodigal son has a, in the past, has had a very negative, and to and this, at this time and in the future, has a very positive identity. But uh, it, it it's a true paradox. It's like a coin. One side very negative, one side very positive. But that's where the prodigal son comes into play. One side was very negative, and one side was very positive. And today it is very positive. In the past, it was very negative. And when you read this book and you really study it, I think you'll be able to figure out who the prodigal son uh, was and is. It's not just in past tense, it's also in present tense. Uh, would you be able to figure out who uh, the prodigal son is? No. You will not know who the prodigal son is until the day of renewal. Uh, then, and at that point, it may be too late. Uh, so, even though you might not be able to know the identity of, of the prodigal son or the Lamb of God, uh, it's not important that you have to know the identity. Just realize that the parable of the good son and prodigal son, and and know some of his, maybe some of his background, his negative aspects. And understand that there will be a positive aspect and that yeah, that will be revealed in due time. Uh, I hope you will take the time to read this book and also read He Walked the Americas. Um, there's two other manuscripts and I hate to bring this up uh, because you'll have to pay 99 cents to download them off of Kindle Amazon and I don't I don't like that people have to do that. I think the material should be presented free of charge. But if you're interested, there's two manuscripts on Kindle Amazon I would greatly uh, admonish you to get. One is called Jesus and Christ and Me by a Joseph Eagle Claw. And the other is The Kingdom of Isa L by Sean Hera. And those two manuscripts have a lot of truth in them along with this book he walked the americas and those two manuscripts if you understand the material in in those four articles then you will uh you will go a long ways and should be in pretty good shape to uh approach the renewal that is spoken of in this book now as i say the hopi indians and also various other native american tribes speak of it as the day of purification um, I, I think either either one is applicable and, and can can be used um, I, I'll leave with this <clears throat> for for decades maybe centuries the indigenous peoples have been much maligned they've been called savages in truth Many of the indigenous peoples of this earth, whether they're Native American, whether they're African tribes, Asian tribes, Australian Aborigines, m many of the indigenous people are much closer to the truth uh, that is found in these books and manuscripts than any other group of people on the earth. And the fact that they were called savages is a real travesty. And the, the day will come when people will realize that they that they were much closer to the truth and I'm gonna leave you with that thought